Hello, conversation to people. <clears throat> I am a little bit slow getting this lecture made and recorded for you. Um, <clears throat> this will probably get to you late Monday or early Tuesday. Um, the reason is because I'm trying to figure out how to manage our um, final exam schedule. The thing is, next week should be week 14 which would be our review. Um, and then there's makeup classes on the 9th and the 10th, but some, some professors follow the makeup schedule and some don't. So there's a, a, a little bit of flexibility and a little bit of conflict usually happens there. Um, if we don't figure out how to do any exams on the makeup days, then it, we have no choice but to do uh, the final exams split you into two groups and do 13th and 20th. But my concern is that some students will not be here or want to be here on December 20th. The last two days of class are technically um, December 20th and December 21st. But usually students are wanting to be out of the dormitory or um, not be concerned about exams on the very last two days of class. I'm familiar with that. So this is my proposal. Um, <clears throat> please, when you watch this lecture, pay attention to this announcement. Um, I would like to, next December, next Monday, December 6th, I would like to have a Zoom meeting so that we can properly fix the final exam schedule. I will give you the midterm, I will give you the final exam review and any questions you have um, related to, you know, the class as a whole, you can ask me. I think that's the best thing to do. So we're going to have <clears throat> one more Zoom meeting. The Zoom meeting will be um, on December 6th and uh, it'll be <clears throat> 11 o'clock for the morning section and uh, 1 p.m. <clears throat> for the afternoon section, okay? <clears throat> Those of you who skipped the first class, there was one particular young lady who skipped the first class and jumped into the second class, you are not allowed to do that. You have to wake up in the morning. 11 o'clock is not that early, so get up and you know, take a shower and get ready um, to pay attention to class. It's only an hour. It's not a not even a long. If you were coming to school, as you know, uh, older students, the lectures are usually an hour and a half or an hour and forty five minutes with a ten minute break. We're just going to have forty five minutes to an hour max talking about final exam, uh, exam schedule what questions are on the exam and anything else related to presentations or grading or attendance that needs to be addressed. Um, it's better for me to just talk to all of you at once than to go back and forth with all the emails, okay? So um, that's the plan. Next Monday, please show up at uh, the correct time for your section and um, we will wrap up the class with some review and scheduling. Hopefully, um, some of you will be able to do your exam at the end of next week. Um, if you'd rather not, or <clears throat> if you don't care, um, I will let people um, come do the exam on the 20th. So there will be multiple days. Um, we'll figure out the schedule and then I'll post it after we, after we have our Zoom meeting uh, next Monday, okay? So don't forget, this is essential. If you don't come, I'm just going to put your exam on the day that I choose, and that's your fault. All right, good. One chapter left, the last um, question, the last topic for our final exam, <clears throat> and the last topic to discuss is uh, adventures. I chose to call this, I always call this lecture Adventure Time, um, because, um, I do like that TV show, if you know Finn and Jake. Uh, that is a kind of a, they go on adventures, crazy adventures um, of all different 
types and and styles <clears throat> and um i think i think they that t television show may embody adventure better than any other um television show i can think of the reason is because you don't have to satisfy all of these criteria to go on an adventure. Just having some of them is enough. But I've just kind of made a list here of what constitutes an adventure. When you say, oh, I went on an adventure, it could include some of these things or it could include all of them. So basically what adventure means is you're a person who's seeking out doing something, which is exciting. I would say the two essential things there is you have to do something, you have to go somewhere, you have to do something um, to have an adventure, and and it has to have some emotion. It has to have some energy involved. Excitement is essentially the you know um, very powerful emotion of wanting and to do something and getting energy from a situation. So those two things would be set the you know tone. For an adventure um, all of these other things kind of are supplementary and uh, they can be included too something that that is involved you would say with an adventure is probably some some element of difficulty if it's too easy or simple then it's not interesting and th therefore it's not going to be exciting um, it's not going to be exciting to talk about it's not going to be exciting to do it and it's not going to be exciting to listen to. Uh, so you're going to have some sort of challenge involved in there. And that's, that's one of the words that I learned first in Korean. Because the, the first television show that I started watching in Korean was a uh, Muhan Dojan. So uh, in English, that is translated as uh, infinite challenge. Muhan means infinite and Dojun means challenge, as you know. And if you're if you're not Korean and you don't know, now you know. <clears throat> so uh, a challenge is something, and that's what that show, that Korean variety show with Yoo Jae Sok and Park Myung Soo and everything. Um, when you were, I guess this is old stuff now. You were 10 years old, but when I first came to Korea, that's what they did every. Um, I mean, some of the episodes were adventures. They went to New Zealand in one episode. They went to the countryside. Um, you know, they went to Seoul and then they did, you know, um, scavenger hunts you know, all over Seoul and on the subway lines and stuff like that. These are kind of scenarios that they would create um, where they would do something or go somewhere and it's supposed to be exciting and that they would compete against each other. And it was funny because as you, probably all know, um, all of those people are comedians, they're not athletes, um, they're not ninjas or anything, so they're not very good uh, at competitions, so it's usually, um, usually they, they make a lot of mistakes, which makes it funny. Um, <clears throat> so another thing, another aspect that might add to the feeling of adventure that you have to heighten the sense of adventure is um, to do something that other people haven't done. Uh, in our writing class, we just recently talked about the amazing people <clears throat> in the book, uh, in the textbook. We had a chapter on amazing people, and you know, one of the pictures was uh, some people camping uh, and they were hanging, they had ropes and they were hanging on a cliff, like they're mountain climbing and they're in their sleeping bags and their, their tent, but they're suspended like 300 meters off the ground. Um, I'd say that's adventurous and unusual. Uh, and I would say it's also dangerous. If you, if you um, roll out of your sleeping bag the wrong way, yeah, it's a long way down. Um, <clears throat> risk, risk doesn't necessarily have to entail, you know, physical, personal danger. It can still be risking other things, right? You can risk your money. Um, some people think that's, it, you know, adds to a thrill, a sense of thrill or adventure. I mean, Las Vegas is a famous city in the United States. There's lots of um, different forms of entertainment, but one of the things it's most famous for is gambling. And 
since uh, the house always wins, otherwise it wouldn't exist, um, it's uncommon for people to come away from Las Vegas having won money. You're not going to Las Vegas to make money. You're going to um, play and lose money. But that's not what you think. You think you might get lucky. Uh, and that adds to the ex excitement and the thrill. Because you know, uh, if you're smart, you know that you're most likely gonna lose your money. It's risky. But the, you know, the tantalizing chance that you may win the jackpot or, you know, win at the blackjack table uh, or the poker tournament is enough uh, to provide you with uh, that excitement um, that human beings desire. Thus, the attitude you have to have if you're going to overcome the risks and the danger and the challenges and the difficulty means that you need to be bold. You need to, you know, be assertive and not afraid um, of losing, of failing. Um, and that's why the, at the bottom there's that personality trait. You gotta be brave. Um, adventurous people are very rarely timid, shy, um, submissive type people. They are, they, you know, fortune favors the bold, as they say. So some of these great, great men, great adventurers, great explorers, and great figures, um, you, you look at them, if you look at them carefully, you would say they are great gamblers. They are, they take huge risks. In one small, you know, if something had gone slightly differently, who knows how things would have turned out. These, these legendary figures, um, Napoleon, uh, Julius Caesar and uh, Alexander the Great. These are some of the great um, figures and military figures and political figures in Western history. You can look at their stories and their lives and you can say they're very bold and they could easily have died. Um, Alexander could have had his head cut off when he was charging against the Persians any number of time. Ju times. Julius Caesar fought personally even when he was old ran into you know, the ranks and grabbed a shield and started fighting. Napoleon tried to hold a bridge and grab a flag and, you know, uh, flutter the flag back and forth, um, easily could have got shot. George Washington was also famous for riding around in the middle of the battle with a big hat, um, where one bullet could have finished, um, could have changed history. So um, these are the type of personalities um, that that uh, become involved in these great stories now I'm not saying I'm not saying all of these things are adventures per se but um, you can argue that um, Alexander the Great going all the way to India uh, on a military campaign was one of the greatest adventures of the ancient world certainly Napoleon didn't have a good time in his adventure um, going to Russia in 1812, he goes all the way to Moscow and then has to lose his, his army and has to turn around and retreat um, in defeat. But this is this is also the the kind of thing that satisfies all these cr criteria. They're great adventures. Um, explorers and expeditions became something that Western people um, conceived of as great adventures. They they um, we're looking for wealth. I mean, we let's be clear that um, there was a financial incentive here that they knew they might die. Uh, they knew that um, it was going to be very difficult or perhaps impossible in some cases. Some people believed it. They, it, it just couldn't be done. But the prospect of that jackpot, of winning, of finding the, the trade route to the east, or um, discovering gold, or silver, uh, or a, a new uh, unexplored continent ready to be um, exploited for its its wealth, for its resources, were the were the driving um, 
factors. They were the things that caused these, these people to do these things that normal people wouldn't do. If there was no huge reward being, you know, dangled uh, in front of them, they, they wouldn't have done it. So that's why we say fortune favors the bold, even though usually it doesn't. <laughs> usually most of the people that tried this stuff end up dead. Even some of the most famous explorers like Ferdinand Magellan, who was certainly a bold man, uh, he traveled around the world, but he didn't quite make it because in the Philippines, he jumped off the ship and tried to fight against hundreds of native people by himself. And um, that was a little bit too bold. So uh, he, he died and uh, his ship returned to uh, Europe, but uh, he never actually made it around the world. The first captain to make it around the world was Sir Francis Drake. And he is a famous English privateer and captain, but he also became too bold and uh, died on an expedition fighting against the Spanish. Um, so that's what happens. That's the, that's the life of an adventurer. Uh, in real life, the adventurer often doesn't survive the adventure. That's, that's part of the, that's part of um, exposing yourself to that kind of thing. So we've got three, on page 114 here, we've got three examples, Marco Polo, uh, David Livingston, and Christopher Columbus. Um, you can read about them yourself. You can choose uh, any example you want of adventure. So this is, these are historical examples of adventure. I've just named several, Caesar, uh, Napoleon, Alexander the Great, Francis Drake, Magellan. These are all famous historical figures. Marco Polo, David Livingston, Chris, Christopher Columbus. Choose whichever person you're interested in if that's the way you want to answer this question. Um, <clears throat> grammatically, um, you're, you can describe things. You're going to probably describe it if it's historical in the past tense. Um, and you, you should be aware of the you know, possibility of, of using the passive voice rather than the active voice if you're describing uh, events which you think are happening to the individual, right? Um, Magellan was killed by the native people in the Philippines, right? Alexander the Great died <clears throat> from, um, well, we don't know, some sort of disease when he was only 33 years old. Right. Julius, Caesar, Julius Caesar was assassinated um, by the, the senators, by the conspiracy of uh, Brutus and the other senators. Um, so you just, you just have to, if you're going to talk about a historical figure, be descriptive. Talk about the person, what, what they were like, what they did, and why it constitutes. Make sure that you explain to me why it's adventurous, right? Um, Give me the details and explain why you think it's, it, it qualifies as an adventure, okay? Um, so that's sort of a, a way that you might use the past tense, right? Um, it, with the passive voice. So in the, in the book, it gives you an example of the woman kissed the baby, that's the active voice, or the baby was kissed by the woman. Like I said, Caesar was killed was assassinated by the senators, by Brutus and the senators. Okay, so that takes care of the historical option. <clears throat> of course, you could make it personal instead. You probably would use the active voice if you're talking about yourself, um, but, but if it's a, an adventure that's happened to you um, before, when you're younger, uh, then you're going to use past tense. Um, Camping is an adventure. They use that example on page 116. They've got a list of all kinds of different devices there. There's a backpack and shoes, hiking shoes, um, sewing kit, a pot, a sleeping bag, matches, a whistle, um, a burner, a Bunsen burner, a first aid kit, sleeping mat, a jacket. This is you don't need to make an equipment list, but um, certainly the vocabulary, if you're talking about camping uh, and you have a problem while you're camping, that's what makes it an adventure, right? 
if you go camping and you go you go glamping, if you go glamping, I say I'm going to say that right now that glamping is not much of an adventure. You go there, you park your car, they give you a barbecue, they give you a place to stay. You got electricity, you can plug in your phone, you cook your meal, you drink some beer, you go to bed. It's just like outdoor hotel. It's a pseudo camping. If you go to a campground, if you go to a national park and you you uh, fill up your backpack with all of your supplies and your food and then you tramp up a mountain you know for seven hours and then you find a spot to pitch your tent and you pitch your tent and then it starts raining and then you got to cook your food in the rain and there's wind uh and there's wild animals out there <laughs> make it as as, uh, as, as um, if, uh, eventful as possible um then you know you're you're on an adventure because difficulties, challenges, uh, unfamiliar environments are abounding in your situation. So I'm not saying adventures are always, they're not always fun. I never said anywhere that they have to be fun. Uh, an adventure can be miserable, right? Uh, let's be honest, I don't think most of the time Christopher Columbus was having a good time on a ship when he went across the Atlantic. Neither um, was David Livingston while he was, you know, trying to find the the, um, the source of the Nile and tramping around in the jungle, um, getting diseases and and um, you know navigating between uh, all the different landscapes and people that he was unfamiliar with. It's probably really really hard, painful um, experience. And Marco Polo also was gone. Um, he was gone from Italy for like 25 years. And one of the reasons he didn't come back sooner is because I don't think the, the uh, court of Kublai Khan in China was going to let him go. So he had to stay there. And in a sense, he was a sort of a prisoner for a while. So he finally made his way home. I don't think he set out thinking that half of his life would be spent in Eastern Asia, right? Um, but anyway, it worked out in the end because uh, he became um, he wrote, wrote his story, he, he wrote an account of his travels, and he became, um, you know, a star celebrity explorer forever. Um, so his place in history was assured, but, you know, this is, this is a very difficult experience to undergo. So when you, when you have your personal adventure, um, there can be, um, there can be suffering. Can be difficulty and suffering and pain and trauma that's can be part of the adventure it doesn't need to be or it can be just uh, exciting happy surprising amazing um, you know satisfying rewarding it's you choose what adventure you want to describe fictional now this one's also I think they're all equally valid it doesn't matter what type of way you want to talk about your subject I think um, Fictional ones are fun because um, they're kind of idealized, right? So like when you, if you choose like Robinson Crusoe, um, the famous book, um, that's an adventure where Robinson Crusoe is, you know, marooned and he has to survive. Uh, that, that kind of fits the criteria perfectly because that's, you know, that's a prototype of an adventure novel. If you want to talk about Indiana Jones, you know that's one of the most famous. Um, it's one of the most famous adventure type movies for a reason because it's uh, you know an explorer, archaeologist discovering uh, relics. Um, I saw some really funny memes on the internet um, commenting about how unrealistic Indiana Jones is. Right? Normal, normally, when archaeologists historians, anthropologists, they show up to a site. They don't actually find a skull, you know, um, covered in diamonds that's sitting there waiting for them to like overcome some traps so that they can steal this it, precious ancient artifact and become super rich and famous, right? Usually what an archeologist do is sit at a desk and type 
for days and days and days and then submit proposals and documents to try and get governments and universities to provide funding and permission so that they may go to a site and then dig with like a tiny little pencil for years and years until they can find the shape of a building. That's what archeological research is really like. It's not swinging from ropes over pits of snakes and, and getting jewel encrusted relics and bringing them home. Also, like, I mean, once, once in uh, 1,000 tribes or 10,000 or 1 million tribes, you get something like um, the, the, t the tome of, uh, the, the tomb rather, the tomb of Tutankhamun, right? King Tut, um, that, was a, that was a special case. All of those tombs in the, the Valley of the Kings in Egypt had been already um, broken into. The, the, or the thieves had already been there, stolen all the gold off of all of the pharaohs. But uh, Tutankhamun's, um, his, his uh, tomb was buried um, underneath, behind some other, you know, false, um, <clears throat> look, look what looked like a, a false tomb. And it was, it was preserved because uh, some, some of the, um, <clears throat> The cave was collapsed and it was blocked so nobody could access it so when they finally found it it was intact and there's there's only one like that it's unique um, so usually you're gonna end up showing up and somebody's already stolen everything there's grave robbers grave robbing was a very lucrative thing a few years later somebody would come and steal all the king's gold that he was buried with and then and take it off somewhere even though that's probably very unlucky to steal a dead person's um, jewelry, but that's what many people did. It was just so common. So all of that adventure stuff that's idealized and, and looks like um, um, it's common for, for a professor or an archeologist or historian to do in the Indiana Jones is all amplified and, ir and unrealistic. But nonetheless, you're allowed to talk about a fictional character if and and explain again why you would you would describe this experience in this person as an adventurous person uh, who, who experienced a great adventure right um right and then there's this, this last category i added it in a few years ago because um <clears throat> this is one of the common things that people like to do these days is is uh do things that are leaning towards the dangerous, risky um, activity. And we, we call these things extreme sports or extreme challenges, right? Um, a good example is uh, Mount Everest, right? Mount Everest was a unique achievement um, that was accomplished by Sir Edmund Hillary. And I'm going to forget uh, his companion, his leader, who, who brought him to the summit. But um, the, there, there, have been, there have been people from Nepal, ostensibly, that may have gone to the top before. But the person who got credit for going to the top is uh, Sir Edmund Hillary. And that, that was a, and when he did it, it was just him and his partner who um, achieved that amazing feat and that adventure. But now there's groups. It's a tourist thing. Um, you can go to Mount Everest and you can go to like base one, base two, base three. And you can go all the way up to the top if you can. People die all the time uh, trying to do this. And it's a, it's a great adventure. It's something, I'm climbing the tallest mountain in the world. Um, but the, of course, there's a downside to this. Um, when you have, any time you have too many people, you know, going in one place, it, it ends up starting to turn into a tourist trap and it starts being less of an adventure and more of like a package where you're like, okay, oh yeah, did you, what did you da do last year? I can't, I climbed Mount Everest. Oh, I did that too a couple of years ago. Um, then you start losing, it loses some of its attraction because it's too common. But also, you know, environmental damage. Human beings leave garbage and they, they affect the environment. You step on things and you, you cause wildlife to relocate um, and, and 
paths, you carve paths through the mountains that never were there before. Um, and of course, lots of people try to do these things and they're not, like I said, they're not elite athletes. They're not professional mountain climbers. They're just regular people who are trying to maybe do something a little bit too extreme. Um, but that's a very, I mean, that's an extreme example of extreme um, uh, challenges. More, co more common things are like bungee jumping or jumping out of airplanes, but I, that's, those things are just exciting moments, right? So for you to go on a real adventure, there, there has to be a, a little bit more of an extensive thing, right? Just jumping out of an airplane once uh, isn't uh, really, or, or going paragliding or, or mountain climbing one time is not really an adventure because it doesn't have any duration. It's just one action. So if you're gonna choose something extreme, Make sure it's like a sequence of events. That's what we're looking for here. Just like in the book, right? When it's talking about um, <clears throat> David Livingston and, and then the lion, um, it's that's an adventure because there's things that happen in a sequence. So you have to describe the events uh, and then explain, not just say, I did one thing and that was exciting. So. Make sure that there is a sequence involved as well. I should add that up here. <clears throat> Make sure that you're describing. Make sure you're describing a sequence of events when you talk about the adventure too, not just a single action, right? So it has to be things have to happen. You have to go somewhere. You have to go somewhere, and things have to happen. It's not a, a single action like shooting a rifle or jumping out of an airplane. You have to talk about multiple actions. Okay, and that kind of wraps up our topics for this semester. Um, <clears throat> there's more stuff in the examples. There's a excursion and transportation um, paragraph passage about, uh, that, about culture that you can read on page 120, but um, that's it. That's it for our topics. So, other than that, we just have to arrange our exam schedule and you have to hand in your presentations, of course, for me to look at. And the, um, we'll arrange the exam schedule and do the review next Monday. And all that remains after that is actually taking the interview. Okay, so I'll see all of you next Monday. Uh, thank you for listening and, and I hope you enjoyed this class. I'll see you for one more Zoom lecture next Monday. Uh, Monday, December 6th, and then uh, the exam after that. Take care. Have a good week.